In this video, I want to tell you about 10 great board games that will be available at Essen, and give you an idea about whether you might like them. If you find it useful, please support the channel on Patreon. Babylonia is a new game from Rainer Knizia, arguably the best and most prolific board game designer of all time. This one takes inspiration from three of his former games, Samurai, Through the Desert, and last year's Blue Lagoon. Set in ancient Mesopotamia, you're sending out your nobles to secure good relationships for your clan with the cities, and you take it in turns to place two of your tokens anywhere on the board, stamping your claim on that region. You might want to go next to a city, because when they're surrounded they'll score, the player who controls the most land surrounding it will win the city. But that's not all, everyone will score the relevant nobles they have connected to the city. This city is only interested in merchants, the pot symbols. Every player will score two points for each pot they have that is connected by their tokens to the city, no matter how far back it goes. So as the game goes on, you're building up huge pathways of your pieces. Ideally, you want to reach every city with an uninterrupted trail of your tokens, but that's where the joy of competition brings this game alive, as you try to block each other off and stop their clans from spanning the entire board so that your clan spans the entire board instead. The point scoring starts off slow and small. The early game is all about securing the locations that will keep you connected to as much as possible, because later on the game rises to a crescendo and you're bagging 30 points per city. If you gain control of a ziggurat, you can pick one of these cards, which gives you an incredible advantage, such as being able to play more tokens on your turn, or making every empty river space a connection for your pieces. Babylonia pulls you between the competition over cities and ziggurats, like in Knizia's game Samurai, and the relentless land fight for pathways, trying to stay connected to everything, like in Blue Lagoon and Through the Desert. It's one of those games where you want to do everything, immediately, and it feels like you're always one step behind the tide. It's quick moving, a breeze to learn, but with a challenge that always keeps you on your toes and watching the other players. In other words, it's classic Reiner Knizia. Deep Blue is this year's big game from Days of Wonder, the company behind Ticket to Ride. You play as a team of divers competing to get the most treasure from shipwreck sites. And the core of the game are those dives, where you draw gems out of the bag and decide whether to keep pushing your luck to get more or bow out early before you go bust and lose everything. What sets this apart from other push your luck games is that you can go diving with other players which keeps everyone involved. You've got the players who are desperate to keep drawing gold and silver, and the other players who are desperate to see their rivals hit a sea creature or lose an oxygen tank so they're forced to resurface. Black and blue gems are dangerous. The first one is a warning, but the second one will make you go bust, unless you have a way to protect yourself from it. If you can't play a card to cancel it out, you'll have to resurface and you'll leave with nothing. If the other divers can protect themselves, then they can keep finding treasure without you. Except it's the leader who decides whether to keep going. You can't leave until they leave. So if the leader thinks you've got no more protection cards in your hand, they could keep drawing gems to try and make you go bust so that only they score the treasure. I love that with every bag pull, there's so much to consider, not just about what's in it for you, but how it helps your rivals. These scouting spots are a touch of genius. If you turn up to a wreck site early, you place your boat on one. You can play it safe by going on a black or a blue spot, which lets you ignore one of those hazards if they come up. Or you can double down on gold, silver, or rubies. If you find a ruby when you're in the matching scouting spot, you get 10 points instead of the usual four, but only if you get out before you go bust. These spots can help you score loads and mean that two people on the same dive can come away with wildly different numbers of points. The crew cards are multi-use. You can spend them to move your boats around, to get into position to join in on other dives, or to recruit more crew cards into your hand and improve your chances for the future. Some will score you more points when you find certain treasure. These green and purple gems are obscure artifacts that are worth nothing to your average idiot, but if you've got an expert in your crew that knows how to best list them on eBay, you can score huge points for them. That promise is enough to keep you going, to risk everything you've earned so far, and makes for a nail-biting finish whether you pull it off or go bust. To get your used cards back, you have to spend a turn to rest, you shuffle them up and draw three. It's always tempting to spend your turn diving, that's where the points are. But if you haven't rested lately, you won't have the cards to stop your dive from being a damp squib, and you'll go home with little more than a damp squid. Deep Blue is an incredible game. It fits the Days of Wonder mold perfectly, with quick turns and light rules. I love how thematic it is, and it's exciting. Each dive is a mini spectacle. 
It makes Push Your Luck a wonderful collective experience. This is one of my favorite games of the year. Don't miss it. Paranormal Detectives is a murder mystery game, with one player playing the ghost of the victim, trying to communicate how they died to the other players. The ghost can only send messages in stereotypical ghostly ways, such as through a Ouija board, by making noises, or by drawing on a player's back. The detectives are racing to be the first to solve the mystery by working out who killed the victim, why they did it, where it happened, how it happened, and what weapon they used. What sets this apart from Cluedo is that there's no predefined list of suspects or murder weapons to pick from. The answer could be anything. The ghost is given a card telling the unique story of how and why they died. As a detective, information will come in fragments. A word mouthed to you. A selection of tarot cards. It's up to you to fill in the gaps. You've got strangled and concert. So maybe the cellist did it with a string. You play a card to choose how the ghost will communicate with you and ask any question you like. Often you'll just go obvious and ask who killed you, but the ghost response is out there for everyone to see, so it'll help your rivals too. If possible, you wanna ask a more specific question that only you will understand the answer to. Choosing how you get your message is crucial. It's a lot harder for the ghost to tell you they were killed by a conductor by drawing through your wrist than by mouthing one word. For the ghost, the fun is in the creative ones, like deciding what three second charade to perform, what noise to make, or how on earth to arrange two pieces of string to look like a tractor. Any game that has you drawing on each other's back is silly fun, but it's brilliant how much you'll analyze what you felt because it could win you the whole game. Like a good whodunit, you're drip fed your facts. At the start, you'll feel completely lost. A clue on its own might mean nothing to you, but you note it down, and it's not until later after finding something else out that you realize they were drawing a tennis racket on your back, not a frying pan. Paranormal Detectives is a brilliant, family-friendly murder mystery game. It's the perfect modern replacement for Cluedo. <laughs> pret porte is a heavy strategy game about running a business in the fashion industry. These contracts, buildings, and employees are your business, your engine, that make designs easier to acquire or improve your chances of winning awards. But they all come at a cost, and in pret porte money is extremely tight. It takes place over a year, and each month you have to pay your staff and building costs. If you expand too quickly, throwing money at models and imported materials, you won't have enough to pay the bills, and you'll be forced to take a high interest loan. If you plan for it, you can go to the bank and get a line of credit, but only if you've got a decent fashion line to show for yourself. If you can show the bank manager you're launching a big collection soon, you'll be able to borrow more money. It's one of many clever thematic touches that set pret porte apart from other Euro games. For example, when it comes to buying the material you need, you can decide, do you opt for the cheaper local source or splash out on silk imported from Italy? The industry can tell the difference in quality and you'll earn respect for it, but with the money you spent on it, you could have afforded to buy material for another design and made more profit. At the end of each quarter, you submit your collections to the fashion shows. You must have a line of matching styles, whether it's evening, casual, or business wear. Each show has a different priority. You might be competing to have the best PR or the biggest collection. You can see ahead for the whole game which criteria you need to focus on and when to plan your strategy. pret porte is not a game for the light-hearted or light-minded. It's full of incredibly tough decisions, and just like in business, it can be unforgiving. There's a lot going on, and trying to balance the books alone is a tough job, not to mention staying ahead of everyone else. If you've got the brain and patience for heavy Euro games, you'll be rewarded here with a refreshing theme and one it does a good job of getting across. <laughs> King's Dilemma is a legacy game that can best be described as an unofficial Game of Thrones storytelling game. You play as one of the noble houses of this fictional kingdom, who sit on the king's trusted small council and decide the fate of the country. Every day in Ankis, there are problems to deal with. Tribes are at the border threatening your security. There are food shortages and the matter of a royal wedding to deal with. It's your job to face these dilemmas. There will be hundreds of them over the course of the campaign and every time you must make a tough decision. Each player will vote. Should you pardon the thief? I or nay? Democracy isn't fair, Players can make their vote stronger by spending their power. You'll take sides, scheme with rival houses to coordinate a victory for what you believe is right, or at least what suits your family. If you force through a decision, you'll write your house's name on it and permanently stick it to the board. The North remembers, 
and it'll impact your role in future games. Each game of King's Dilemma represents the entire reign of a king. Next time there will be a new king. The faces change, but the dilemmas never go away, and the stories continue through generations. Remember that thief you pardoned? That wasn't a standalone event. Your actions have far-reaching consequences. Just like in life, the full consequences of your actions aren't known until you take them. But you have an idea. If you don't repair the windmills, then the citizens will go hungry and they'll lose faith in you. The board tracks how well the kingdom is faring. A good ruler would want all the tracks to be at the top, but you're not a good ruler. Your house has long-term goals that represent the legacy your family wishes to create. They'll take many games to achieve, but give you something to always aim towards over the campaign. But in each individual game, you have the short-term desires of the current generation of your house. Last time, you might have been a ruthless Tywin, seizing power by throwing the crown into disrepair, whereas this time you're a more even-handed Tyrion who wants the realm to thrive. It's a dynamic that puts players against each other, creates shifting alliances, and delivers as many arguments and acts of bribery as the theme promises. I'm in love with how well King's Dilemma tells its story. It's such an elegant design, complete immersion but with minimal rules. You never feel like you're pausing the actual game to turn to a book to read the story. You're in the story with every decision. If you've got the time and the group for a campaign game, I would recommend this over any I've ever played. Point Salad is an ingenious little card game that anyone could play. You're trying to get the most points by collecting the vegetables you need. What you need is actually up to you because you also have to get these gold cards which will score for certain vegetables. This card will score two points for each pepper I have at the end of the game. On your turn, you can either take any two vegetable cards or one of the gold cards from the three stacks. If you see one you like, you better take it because as soon as someone draws from that column, it will be flipped and become a vegetable for the rest of the game. It's a tough decision between grabbing pairs of onions that are sitting there, which you know will score you five points, and picking a gold card that is worth nothing now but could make you 40 points by the end of the game. Each vegetable counts for every gold card you have at the end, so having these three cards means every tomato I pick up is worth nine points to me. Some cards also come with punishing minus points for certain vegetables, which will limit your options as you try to avoid picking them up. But I like the way they reward you for that inconvenience by giving you bigger points for the tomato. Other cards have you competing with other players for the most, and you'll want to keep an eye on their stash. And for example, if another player has loads of cabbages, you can choose to get in their way by making sure to take a vegetable from the right column so that the gold card they need gets flipped and they miss out. Point Salad is one of the best simple card games to come out in years. It's cute and quick to play, but it's still got enough decisions to keep it interesting. City Skyline is based on the popular video game and SimCity killer, City Skyline. Unusually for a city building game, in this one you're playing cooperatively to make your city work. It's all about finding the right balance to keep your citizens happy. Your city needs electricity, so you build yourself a wind turbine. Except that costs you money, so you need to build an industrial zone. But before you do that, you need to build a school because the industrial zone will only make money if it's next to one. Except building the school costs money and... Welcome to the stressful world of city planning. You each have cards in front of you and take it in turns to build something. It takes a lot of discussion to plan when to build stuff so you can balance cash flow and get the most benefits. And how to fit it in on the map because everything is an awkward shape and you don't want to waste precious space. Every time you build something, it will throw off the delicate balance of your city. That industrial zone creates jobs, which means you've now got too many jobs. So you'll need to build some houses to lure some new job fillers or people. I love that everything you do makes sense for the theme. City Skyline feels different. In most cooperative games like Pandemic, there's an AI trying to kill you, but here you lose if your planning goes wrong. If you max out on crime, for example, you're not allowed to build things that raise it further, and you'll be desperately hoping that you draw a police station to bring it down. If you can't legally play any of your cards, you lose the game. The luck of the card draw can be frustrating. If your city is relying on one thing to turn it around and it won't come out the deck, it doesn't feel very fair, but the challenge of the game is in playing the cards as you're dealt them, working best with what you have right now. This is a newbie friendly game, and it might feel a bit one dimensional for some people, but it's a fresh take on city building, and aside from the dated graphic design, it's a great welcome to board games for lovers of the video game. Valley of the Vikings is my top pick for a kids game at Essen this year. It's Haber's second Kinderspiel winning game in as many years, 
after last year's amazing Dragon's Breath. This one is board game bowling. You take it in turns to roll the ball and knock over the barrels. That in itself is pretty fun, but what makes it a game is that each barrel represents a player. When you hit a barrel over, you move that player up on the track. You're trying to push one player off the track into the water at the end because when that happens, every other player will score based on where they are, winning plastic coins or stealing them from another player. You're trying to get yourself into a good spot on the track to score the most points and move your rivals along so they'll go in the water. So every time you line up to roll the ball, you have a plan about which barrels you want to hit. And just like any great dexterity game, sometimes you get it right and sometimes you fail miserably. It's fun for the other players because they're watching, hoping you accidentally knock them onto a great spot or miss them entirely. If the player before you knocks down some barrels, you can place them wherever you like, setting yourself up to hit one big collection or avoid something specific. That bit of planning makes it even funnier when your skittle skills let you down. Dexterity games are the best way to entertain adults and kids at the same time, especially as kids are usually better. Valley of the Vikings has got a fun, unique challenge with just enough game to make it nice and competitive. Letter Jam is a cooperative word building game from the makers of Codenames. Every player has a secret five letter word that they're trying to guess with the help of clues from the other players. Each player has one of their secret letters facing everyone else. They can never look at it. So when you look out at the table, you can see everyone else's letters. To give information to each other, you need to think of words that use the letters you can see. I can see T, A, and C, so I can make the word cat, but I don't say the word. Instead, I place these numbers down to indicate where their letters appear in the word. Of course, the players with a letter in the word can only see the other two letters. So Mr. T knows it's a three letter word beginning with C and A and has a decent idea of what it could be. He writes it down onto his paper. But my clue has left Mrs. C pretty lost because she doesn't know if the word is bat, cat, fat, hat, mat, pat, rat, sat, or tat. Basically, it was a terrible clue. The challenge in clue giving is trying to think of long words that use everyone's letters and specific quirky words that couldn't be mistaken for something else. But that's not always possible, and the fun of the game is in trying to work out what your letters could be. If you're not confident to guess this round, you can wait. You know it's either B, T, or R, so hopefully the next clue will narrow it down. When you lock in a letter, you write your guess on the sheet. It's not until the end of the game that you'll find out if you're right. By then you'll have five letters written down and you have to rearrange them to guess your secret word. It's a big finish when you see if everyone got it right and it's hilarious when you reveal them and find out that the F you were convinced by turned out to actually be a P. Letter Jam is a really fun twist on word games. You're still using the same Scrabble muscles, but to help each other and win together. It can be a little quiet as you're all stuck in thought and because you can't talk about your words, but the reward for that is a really satisfying deduction game. Ishtar is a tile laying game in which you're growing gardens in the desert, co-designed by Bruno Catala, and it's just as thinky as you'd expect from him. On your turn, you take a garden tile and connect it to a fountain or existing garden. The aim is to grow and take ownership of large flower beds, these dark green regions. You score points for every flower in your flower beds. You're competing to own the biggest flower bed connected to each fountain. Flower beds can't ever join, so if you stamp out your territory early, your opponent will have less room to grow. There's a similar fight for space with the gardens. Gardens from separate fountains can't join. So if you expand a garden out towards where your opponent is growing their flower bed, they'll be stifled, like a tiny plant sharing its soil with the roots of a giant oak. There's lots of other ways to get points. Each time you place a tile on top of gems on the board, you collect them. They can be spent to buy trees, which are worth points, or you can spend two to unlock special abilities on your player board. The bottom row of the player board will let you do things like place one of these flower bed tiles with four flowers on, or unlock an extra assistant to take ownership of another flower bed. To unlock a top row ability, you need to have unlocked the one below it first. And the top row gives you ways to score, such as this one which will turn every gem you have at the end of the game into points. The player board gives you many different paths to take your strategy down. You can score off your flower beds being adjacent to trees or next to these sacred tablets. Ishtar, like many Bruno Catala games, is light on the surface, but with loads of depth to get stuck into. You can try a new strategy every time you play. I personally prefer the more aggressive nature of the tile laying in Babylonia, but friendlier, thinkier gamers should check out Ishtar. Those are the hottest games at Essen this year. It takes me weeks to research the games for this video, play them, write about them, and film it. I wouldn't be able to do it without financial support on Patreon, which is currently at the lowest it's ever been. 
If you found this video useful, please help the channel keep going at patreon.com forward slash actualol, just like Andrew Kuchling does. Thank you, Andrew. And if you're new to Actual Lol, make sure to subscribe. I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching. <laughs>